Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be looking at working with extraordinary dreams. With me is Professor Stanley Krippner, the Alan Watts Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University. Dr. Krippner is also the co-author of an interesting book called Extraordinary Dreams and How to Work with Them. He is the former director of the Dream Laboratory at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he is the recipient of Lifetime Career Awards from several psychological associations and is the author of over a thousand academic papers. Welcome, Stan. Thank you. Welcome to be here. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to be with you. If I may, let me begin by sharing with you a dream that changed my life. I'd love to hear it. I was a graduate student in criminology back in 1972. I have a doc, uh, excuse me, I have a master's degree in criminology that I got from the University of California. And at that time in my life, I was doing field work in San Quentin prison, working with murderers <laughs> and rapists. And I, it was depressing work. And I made a decision that I wanted to change my focus. I loved abnormal psychology, but I wanted to look at positive forms of human deviance, not negative. I wanted to study psychic phenomena, mysticism, intuition, creativity, and where I was at Berkeley, there were no opportunities. You could study crime and, and psychopathology in many different departments, but if you wanted to study the, the higher ranges of human potential, th there was nothing. And I agonized and agonized over this for months. And one day, I told myself that I was going to have a dream. And I was going to have a dream that night. I just knew it. I, it's why I told myself it was, I wasn't giving myself a suggestion. It was like an inner knowing. And indeed, that night, I had a dream. I dreamt that I was visiting some friends in Berkeley. I knocked on their door at their student housing. Nobody answered the door. Uh, and I knew in the dream where they kept the key. I found the key, let myself into their apartment, and there sitting on the middle of the floor of their living room was a magazine. In my dream, the magazine was called I, E-Y-E which was a magazine back then. Yes. And, and I picked it up and I was paging through the magazine in my dream when I woke up with this incredible feeling, Stan, that I had found the answer. And the funny thing is I had no clue what the answer was, but I had this feeling like, Eureka, I have it. <laughs> and so what I did is I acted out the dream. I put on my tennis shoes. I ran all the way across town in Berkeley to this particular apartment, knocked on the door. Nobody was home, just as I had dreamt. And I, in fact, knew where they kept a spare key mm -hmm. under the doormat. And I found it, I let myself in, walked into the living room, and I knew there was going to be a magazine smack in the middle of the floor, and there was. And the name of the magazine was Focus, which was the magazine of, you may know, of KQED, listener-sponsored radio and television in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And I was paging through the magazine when it just dawned on me that if I wanted to pursue my interests, I could be involved in the nonprofit sector of the media, listener-sponsored media, which was a brand new idea for me mm -hmm. because at that time, Stan, I was a long-haired Berkeley hippie. I did not own a radio or a television. I didn't believe in radio or TV <laughs> at the time. I thought electronic communication is phony baloney. I just want authentic face-to-face. -face. And I changed my mind at that moment 
I went and I volunteered at the local Pacifica station in Berkeley, KPFA. They told me, here, you can sit at this desk and when you hear the buzzer ring, push the button and let people in the door. And <laughs> even though I had my master's degree, I did that. And within three weeks, I had produced, uh, learned how to produce a radio program. And the program director came to me and said, I like that and we have a slot every Tuesday and Thursday at noon, we have a program called The Mind's Ear. And we'd like you to interview people. And so all of a sudden, I found myself sitting across a table with world-class experts, people like Stanley Krippner, coming into the San Francisco Bay Area on their book tours. And I realized I had access to you know some of the best minds in the world now. That gave me the confidence to create an individual interdisciplinary doctoral major for myself in parapsychology at Berkeley. And I've always felt that when it comes to dreams, that uh, it's as if when a person wants to become the best person they can be, there are invisible powers that are just waiting to reach out and help. That's quite a remarkable dream. I'm so glad you shared this with the listeners of this program, yes. And here I am, I'm still doing here interviews. You are. Here you are, yes, right, mm -hmm. right. Well, my co-authors and I thought that it was about time to take these extraordinary dreams, pull them together, put them under several categories, and tell people how to use them. Yeah. In your case, you were just content to have the dream. You went to act it out. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the acting it out was essential for you to make a complete gestalt, a complete circle that that dream was prompting you to do. Yeah. Now, in our book, we have very specific instances like that for people who have or think they have telepathic dreams, clairvoyant dreams, precognitive dreams, many of which they claim have actually saved their lives or the lives of other people. Mm -hmm. Other people have creative dreams and the libraries are filled with scientific inventions, literary, artistic works of art that come from dreams. Just to give you a random sample, Richard Wagner, in terms of some of his early music, felt that the inspiration had come from his intuition, including his dreams. He said to a friend of his, Matilda Weissenstock, in a letter, I never could have come upon such beautiful music myself. And Giuseppe Tartini, who invented the modern violin bow, mm. had a contract to write a sonata and he had a creative block. He couldn't do it. One night he had a dream that he was walking on a beach and there was a little bottle and there was a little imp inside the bottle pounding, let me out, let me out, let me out. And Tarty said, I'll let you out if you will finish my sonata. <laughs> imp said, I'll do anything, I'll do anything. So Tartini pulled the cork out of the bottle, uh -huh. out came the imp and manifested the violin and played this beautiful music. Tartini woke up, wrote it down, and that became actually his best known piece of work and satisfied his employer who was very happy to mm -hmm. have that sonata. So we have Otto Loewy who discovered the connection between nerve cells, that it was an electrochemical connection. All of that came to him in a dream. However, he woke up from the dream, scribbled it down, the next morning couldn't read what he was writing. Oh. That's a warning to our listeners. If you want to write down a dream, make sure you write it down legibly. <laughs> the next night he, like you, incubated the dream. He said, I'm gonna have the same dream tonight. Mm -hmm. He did, wrote it down, next morning, couldn't read a word. <laughs> tried the third time, three times and out. This time he woke up and he went right down to his laboratory, cut apart two frogs, had their hearts in the same test tube, gave the heart of one of them a shock, 
and without any connection, physically, the other heart twinged also. That's when he knew that the one heart was secreting chemicals that stimulated the other heart, and that became known as acetylcholinesterase, and that won him the Nobel Prize. Oh. Could go on and on for the next hour or so talking mm-hmm. about dreams like that. Creative dreams is only one of many, many extraordinary dreams. Right. Lucid dreams now people know about. When I was in graduate school, not only were we not talked about uh, dreams, but in our books there was a little notation. Some people believe that they can dream that they're awake. Of course, this is impossible. You can't be awake and dreaming at the same time. Mm-hmm. Well, then a British investigator by the name of Celia Green came up with a whole book. She wasn't the first to use the word lucid dream. That term had been used several decades earlier. Mm -hmm. But that book triggered a whole range of researches. researches. Keith Hearn in London, Stephen Burge in California. Pardon me? LeBerge. Stephen LeBerge, that yes. pardon my French, <laughs> came up yeah. at the same time with a technique of alerting the person that they were having a dream by noting the rapid eye movements and then uh, triggering them to become awake in their dream. And it was very clever. They were told that if they were awake in their dream, they should make a little square out of the rapid eye movement. And that would indicate that they were aware that they were having a dream. Mm -hmm. So they did that. The rest is history. Now there's mountains of research with lucid dreaming. People have put the lucid dreaming to good use. Athletes in Germany practice different types of athletics during their dreams. Jack Nicholas, the famous golfist, perfected a a uh, golf stroke during a dream. Um, we have people who have had lucid dreams to improve a health condition. Mm-hmm. I know a case myself where somebody wanted a dream about a health condition and was told to eat papaya. Never had heard of papaya went back and found out that there's pepsin in the papaya seeds, their good digestive agent, Mm. cured him of the uh, problem with the digestive Mm -hmm. system, although the doctors had given up on him. So, yes, so dreams Mm -hmm. can be not only extraordinary, they can serve very, very uh, practical use. One of the most interesting forms of extraordinary dreaming, of which I'm aware, uh, is the work in mutual dreaming, where people deliberately try to enter into each other's dreams, sort of have a party together in the dream world. That's right. Well, we have a whole chapter on shared dreams in our book. These, Mm -hmm. of course, are controversial. They're very rare, but we have a number of people who uh, actually have independently written down their dreams and then they compare them and they Mm -hmm. find that they were in the same place at the same time in their dream. Mm -hmm. Carlos Castaneda, for all of his controversy, and you have to be a little bit skeptical when you read his books, devoted his book, The Art of Dreaming, to how to develop shared dreams with a partner. Mm -hmm. And I am told that people have tried that book out and it has actually worked. Mm -hmm. Perhaps so, because he actually had a recipe for lucid dreaming that I tried, and that is to look at your hands while you're falling asleep. Mm -hmm. And then when you have a dream, you look at your hands and you realize that you're dreaming. I tried it out, and I tried it out Mm -hmm. several nights. Eventually, I was with a friend of mine on a train, and I looked at my hands. Great Scott, I'm dreaming. And so I thought, now I'm going to try to influence my friend to raise his hands by mental telepathy. And he raised his hands in the dream. Mm -hmm. And I then broke down and said, look, I'm having a dream and I willed you to raise your hands, so don't be surprised. (laughs) And now maybe your physical body can have the same dream. Mm -hmm. Well, my friend, who is at some distance away, 
uh, did have a dream that night, but I wasn't in it. So that was my attempt at shared dreams. It was a successful lucid dream, but not a successful shared dream. Mm -hmm. Well, since you've referred to some of the esoteric literature, Castaneda in this case, and, and shamans across the world talk about getting information about the use of, for example, plants uh, yes. through dreams. Uh, but the yoga traditions, there's a whole tradition of dream yoga, for, for example. Almost every esoteric tradition has some component uh, that involves working with dreams. Oh, yes, yes. And the wonderful thing is that these esoteric traditions can now be scientifically investigated with our modern tools of phenomenological inquiry, neuroscientific inquiry, mm -hmm. and the Tibetan dream yoga is actually something that was very similar to the lucid dreams that Leberge yes. and Hearn uh, developed some yes. decades ago. Mm -hmm. So, Pierre Weil was a French psychologist who founded a university in Brazil, and along the way, he actually apprenticed himself to a Tibetan yogi or guru, and he learned how to do clear light dreaming. Mm -hmm. He wrote this up, it's a wonderful testimony, and he was able to increase his number of lucid dreams multiple times what would have been expected if they had just occurred randomly. Mm -hmm. And this I think is really probably the first scientific attempt to put the Tibetan dream yoga into uh, into practice and record it mm -hmm. for a scientific audience. Mm -hmm. Well, the opportunities for doing that sort of research must be increasing as so many Westerners trained in Western psychology and Western science travel to the East and find gurus and, and undergo these esoteric uh, courses of training. Oh, good heavens, yes. And you mentioned the shamans who regularly claim to have dreams about deceased people who give them information, yes. especially about their clients. Mm -hmm. And I actually uh, have a friend who had a dream about a grandparent. And of course, it's common for people to have dreams about loved ones, especially yes. family loved ones who have passed over. This is common. But we call these visitation dreams, by the way, in our book. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the grandparents said, I know you've been looking for a document that is important for your family. I hid the document in the basement behind a brick in the wall and you can go down and pull the brick and find the document. Sure enough, she woke up and she did. So this is, shall we say, a verification mm -hmm. of something that came in a dream. Mm -hmm. And who is to say that it was the grandparent, maybe it was her own intuition, yeah. but in any event, it was very anomalous. There are hundreds, if not thousands of bricks in the basement. How would she know what brick to pull mm -hmm. out and find the document? Well, I know one conventional theory would be along these lines, that the brain is a powerful supercomputer, in fact, more powerful than any supercomputer that exists today. Yes. And that if, if you need to solve a problem, the brain will work on it while you're sleeping, and the brain uh, has the capability of coming up and delivering an answer to you. You're absolutely right. From my reading of the literature, mm -hmm. I think that dreams served important purposes in evolution. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been adaptive, they wouldn't have survived. Mm -hmm. And one of them is solving problems. One of them is storing memories. Useful memories get stored. Mm -hmm. Non-useful memories get extinguished. Yep. Another one is downloading emotions, working emotions, even unpleasant emotions, through the system so mm -hmm. that one is bright and fresh the another morning, the next morning. Another one is rehearsal, rehearsing what one has learned, yeah. rehearsing for the future. This is where precognitive dreams come in, mm -hmm. where we have dreams about some future events so we're prepared to cope with them. Yes. So certainly the supercomputer model of the brain 
accounts for the extraordinary problem-solving capacities of the brain while we're asleep, most of which we forget. Mm -hmm. We wake up the next day, we turn to a problem that's baffled us, we now know the answer. We don't give our dreams credit, but yes, indeed, they deserve the credit. Mm -hmm. Well, I had one other extraordinary dream I'd like to share with you. Uh, it, it's another one of those life-changing mm -hmm. dreams. It came unbidden. Uh, I dreamt of a great uncle of mine who I had not seen, uh, well, for well over a decade. And again, this was back in 1972. I was in my early 20s at a point where I was making decisions that would affect my career choice for the rest of my life. And my uncle Harry appeared in this dream and began talking to me in a deep way about my life. And the striking thing in this dream, Stan, is that when I awoke, I was crying and singing at the same time. Hmm. I, my tears were just running down my eyes, and I was singing an old Jewish song from the High Holy Holiday Liturgy uh, called Avinu Malkeno, which means in, in English, our Father, our King, forgive us for all of our mm -hmm. sins. And it was very moving. It's, you know, sometimes they say that there's a spiritual world which is more real than the physical world. And that was the feeling. It was such an intense emotion. It's only happened to me that one time in my life. So I wrote home and said, how's Uncle Harry? I had a dream about him. And my mother called me up immediately. She said, how did you know Uncle Harry had just died? Hmm. And that, that inspired me to think that I had actually contacted him. And I began asking my professors in Berkeley <laughs> uh, at the time, you know, what, what do you make of a, a dream like that? Of course, none of them had anything intelligent to say. And that's sort of what, what made me resolve, you know, this is so important. I'm going to try and find an answer to how I had that experience. It's worth devoting my life to, possibly. Yes. Remarkable dream. And uh, you certainly put it to good use over the years. Absolutely. Another type of extraordinary dream that many people report is a pregnancy dream. Mm. When women dream about the gender of their child, yes. they're right more often than they are wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, frankly, I don't think that this is clairvoyance. I think this is the body telling them that it's going to be a boy or a girl, mm -hmm. especially if they've already had a child. The yeah. body knows whether it's going to be a boy or a girl. Mm -hmm. For firstborns, the body wouldn't know that too well. So that is a little more anomalous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, pregnancy dreams are interesting because pregnant women often dream about animals. Mm -hmm. And of course, the animal are is probably a symbol for the developing fetus. Mm -hmm. And if something goes wrong with the developing fetus, that often shows up in the dream. And some women have made a mm -hmm. visit to the doctor to see if something indeed has gone wrong, and then they can make a decision on whether to mm -hmm. carry the baby uh, forth to birth or not. So we can make much more of the pregnancy dreams than we have mm -hmm. in the past. I have to tell you that I did the first uh, major study on pregnancy dreams. Mm -hmm. And now this has been done frequently. One of my students did her entire dissertation on pregnancy dreams. Uh -huh. Also, I did the first study about dreams, maybe the only study, male to female transsexuals. Oh, yes. And collected a large number of dreams from people who were uh, born male with the male chromosome, chromosomes, but were transsexuals who felt that they were in the wrong body. Mm -hmm. And they elected, for better or for worse, to have the gender change operation. Yes. Well, their dreams are absolutely fascinating because we know that there are sort of typical male dreams in our culture, typical female dreams in our culture. These were right in the middle. Mm. They were so closely down the middle that looking at the dreams, you could not really determine if they were male or female dreams. Mm. So that's part of the dream literature. And 
that is something that uh, again is uh, an extraordinary dream from sort of extraordinary people. Yeah, well, you know, we're just beginning to study the transsexuals. Uh, yes. So this is an important contribution. Going back to the pregnancy dreams, what you said reminded me of reports from uh, the uh, laboratory at the University of Virginia founded by Ian Stevenson studying reincarnation mm -hmm. cases where young children recognize uh, or, or have memories just as soon as they learn to speak of mm -hmm. potential previous incarnations. Yes. Uh, some 2,500 cases, I believe, yes. are mm -hmm. in their database. Uh, one of the components that Stevenson cited is what he called the announcing dream, where the, the mother um, has a dream about of communicating with the spirit that is to be incarnated in the new child and recognizes it maybe as a, a, a relative who had died or a friend who had died. Well, actually, we have a whole chapter on past life dreams. Mm -hmm. And people have a dream that they swear could not be one of their dreams. It must yeah. be from a past life. Yeah. And without doing the extensive research that Ian Stevenson and his successors have done, I have no way of knowing that. But the way I handle that mm -hmm. is to say, all right, maybe this is a dream from a past life, but the fact that you're having the dream now indicates that there must be some sort of connection to your current life. Mm -hmm. So if we resolve the problem in your current life, we will automatically solve whatever is left over from the past life. And that me seems to make them happy, and we can work with the dream from that per particular perspective. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. In the cases that have been scientifically investigated on past lives, dreams are often a, the announcement of that uh, past life. Mm -hmm. Well, our time is up. Once again, Stan, it seems to go so quickly. Thank you for being with me. Great pleasure. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.